want to welcome everyone. It looks like we have a really good turnout of NLM trainees, which is good. And uh, we're going to hear today from Travis Gamble, who's going to present the um, findings of his doctoral symposium. Travis is a, as all of you know, is a PhD student uh, and NLM trainee who hails originally from Little Rock, Arkansas, and went to, did, did his undergraduate studies at University of Arkansas. So take it away, Travis. Okay. Well, thank you for attending today. Um, this is uh, my symposium um, where I'm talking about the general area of uh, research that I'm hoping to pursue. So I appreciate any feedback after I'm done, and if not today, um, by email. Um, the title is Knowledge Representation and Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder. Um, applications, and I'm going to discuss some of the current efforts and possible uh, future research opportunities for me. So I'm going to give a quick background of PTSD and knowledge representations. Um, then I'm also going to discuss three projects. Um, so please forgive me for referring to my notes, but I'm going to try to cover a lot of information. And I'm also, I'll, I'll bring this back up, the outline, to kind of help us stay on track um, and to hopefully avoid some confusion. So post-traumatic post stress disorder, as defined by the DSM, or the Diagnostic Statistical Manual for Mental Health, is a condition resulting from exposure to direct or indirect threat of death, serious injury, or physical threat. Some of the common symptoms of PTSD is recurrent thoughts of the traumatic event, um, irritability, anxiety, um, hyperarousal, um, difficult, difficulty concentrating. And left untreated, these symptoms um, worsen and lead to uh, further serious problems such as clinical depression, um, suicide, um, and violence, and, um, and uh, spousal abuse. And there are many levels of post-traumatic distress. There's acute uh, post-traumatic stress. There's chronic um, PTS with uh, delayed onset. And another more general category that a lot of uh, combat troops um, um, acquire is a, it's called combat operation stress reaction. And so a large focus of my work will be on um, the uh, combat-related uh, post-traumatic stress um, because that's the uh, clinical notes that I've been working with and that's the notes that I will have in the future. But not to get too far ahead of myself, but the knowledge base that I will um, be designing is easily transferable to um, other types of, uh, of post-traumatic stress and other subpopulations. And so some of the statistics with uh, post-traumatic stress, up to 20% of adults in the U.S. that experience some type of tra uh, traumatic event will, will, um, um, will have post-traumatic stress. Women are about twice as likely as men, and um, there's higher rates that have been found in um, African Americans, Hispanics, and uh, Native Americans compared to Caucasians. Children that survive uh, specific disasters um, have PTS and about a prevalence of 30 to 60 percent. In combat troops, they, studies vary on the numbers, but some say that one in, one in five soldiers that return from Iraq or Afghanistan will have uh, post -traumatic, some form of post-traumatic stress. And recently, uh, um, an incidence rate had reached 50% uh, in one time period. And also, um, it's of note, of la last year for 2012, um, the suicide rates were at an all-time high at 22 times per day. But even with this high rate, it, most experts still think it's, it's underdetected. And a lot of the underdetection has to do with these uh, symptoms that show up much later after the trauma has occurred. And so finding veterans with post-traumatic distress is one problem, but trying to get, convince them to seek treatment is another. Um, according to a 2008 RAND study, um, as many as 7 in 10 veterans that are offered mental health care refuse it. 
And surveys and, and focus groups repeatedly show that the attitudes and beliefs of service members and veterans um, still have a, a, a negative uh, stigma with uh, seeking care. And another reason of underdetection that veterans have expressed is frustration with the VA, um, likely because of the difficulty in finding an appropriate treatment. Uh, many, of them, many veterans express that uh, the VA has a difficulty understanding their problems and um, unfortunately they do not come forward and often seek self-medication. But the reality is, is that the VA has made some demonstrable improvements in, in um, the overall care of veterans. But it also has major hurdles, um, especially with regard to PTSD diagnosis and treatment and also the, uh, the growing backlog of disability claims. And prevalence is higher because uh, recent veterans um, have a number of unusual circumstances, um, such as more frequent and longer deployments. Um, also, much of the stressors that take place um, are in combat urban environments, so they have trouble separating um, the war zone when they, when they were to the urban environment when they come back home. And also, our treatments and diagnosis and uh, um, you know, advances in surgery and, and medical practices have improved. And so also in frontline technology. So a lot of these soldiers that would have been lost in past wars, we're saving them now. But a consequence of that is that a, a number of returning troops have a higher percentage of psychological disorders. And because of this high prevalence, the healthcare system, both VA and all over US, is not really prepared to handle this, this high number. The problem in many of, of but there's a lot of, there's a lot of good pro programs and projects that are underway and, and striving to combat this disorder. But the problem with many of the, uh, the initiatives that are taking place is that they're operating in silos instead of collaborating. But even if they were actively seeking to collaborate, there's a lot of interoperability issues to overcome between the different facilities. And so these initiatives share many of the same goals and um, they all have needs to much of the same kind of information. And so from an informatic standpoint, one way to, to uh, support the healthcare system is through initiatives of health information system development in the form of uh, information extraction or um, natural language processing tools and projects. And by developing these, we can uh, uh, give assistance to all healthcare systems. And so one of the areas that we are good at is uh, managing information um, with our research literature. But as we all know, the research literature, it's already vast and it's continuing to grow and so we must continue to find ways um, to, to improve the management of this information. And another area that we're also good at is with accumulating clinical notes in our EHR. But a large percentage of this is in uh, uh, the narrative free text. Um, and especially, uh, this is especially true for mental health information, um, making automated, automation of its usage um, particularly challenging. And so we must continue to develop and improve um, our information systems to support both of these types of information for, on PTSD. And this could come in the form of, of automating, automating, automating clinical processes or um, developing tools to help clinicians and researchers to better understand the disorder. But before we build these tools, we must consider standards and interoperability and ways to maximize collaboration. We must consider the various ways uh, terms and definitions are used in the healthcare and research community. And so what we must think about is, is knowledge representation and a knowledge base that maximizes the capture of meaningful information. Um, there's various types of knowledge representation um, but for the majority of today, I'll be discussing ontologies. Um, this, this appears to be one structure um, 
that is uh, robust enough uh, to handle like the organization uh, that the post-traumatic stress needs. And so often when we think of term extraction, we think of, well, why can't we just do a text search and retrieve that term? Um, or even a regular expression and to, uh, to grab that term. Well, sometimes you can. But with, an on, with the use of an ontology, you can not, not only capture these terms, you can also overcome um, word am ambiguity, um, contextual issues. Um, we can capture temporal information, such, such as the specificity or the intensity of terms. And we can also capture um, um, synonyms when words are negated, and since we are talking about human type text, we also want to capture misspellings. And so terms describing what, we, what we're looking for can also help us um, find information. A common example in the mental health domain is the term hallucinations. Well, we can easily search and find the word hallucinations in clinical notes. However, sometimes the a provider will uh, type exactly what the patient says, and they may not say hallucinations. They may say that they're seeing things that aren't really there. Well, we would like a, to our, our applications and, and knowledge structure smart enough to pick up those instances when um, the words that we're wanting to acquire are not necessarily explicitly clear. And so some of the characteristics of a good knowledge representation system. Coverage means that the uh, knowledge representation covers a depth of information and Without a wide coverage, um, we can't really resolve amb ambiguity. Also um, understood by humans, um, a good KR will be viewed as natural language, so the logic of it should flow freely. Uh, we need to be able to understand what the system knows and be able to draw conclusions from it. Also, by being consistent, we can um, eliminate redundant knowledge or conflicting knowledge, and our knowledge base should also be a. Uh, it also should be um, be consistent and eliminate redundant or conflicting knowledge, and be a medium for efficient computation. And also, the uh, the knowledge representation is used as a model to object to model our objects in the world. So we should be able to easily modify it and and keep it updated. And lastly. Uh, should support intelligent reasoning. Um, so in order to maximize our efforts, intelligent reading, reasoning for the system um, should represent the knowledge base in a way that we can maximize its usage. And so ontologies kind of fit this criteria as a, as a strong, robust structure. So for the remaining lecture, uh, many of the projects that I will talk about um, use knowledge representation and use ont ontologies or ontological artifacts. So ontology, the word ontology has been used in a lot of different um, uh, formats. It originally originated in philosophy and has been used in um, information technology. Um, it's also been used in artificial intelligence, and now it's commonly used in bio, bioinformatics. And the most widely definition for, for the bioinformatic community is a specification of entities um, or concepts, relations, uh, instances, and axioms in a specific area of domain. And so with this model, I'm trying to display that an ontology can conceptually be thought of as a model that represents knowledge. But it also captures relationships. And an ontology is a form of knowledge manage management that facilitates communication between people and organizations' data. It also can improve interoperability between systems. It captures knowledge as a model that can be then be queried by users to answer complex questions. So as more and more medical and, and biomedical knowledge ac accumulates in computers, the problem is efficient retrieval and analysis of this information. 
it can be difficult for researchers to stay current on um, the latest biomedical knowledge and because the problem is that the data is found in a lot of different formats. A lot of the information overlaps with one another. Um, they use different terms, to de diff def de different definitions to define the same terms. And so all of this different formats, the way that information is collected, it's difficult to understand the relationships between the data. So this makes selecting, well, essentially, a lot of the researchers need much of the same information, but they need it in different meanings. Um, so this makes uh, uh, building a knowledge base that handles semantics well very important. So some of the purposes of an ontology, it can be used as a reference um, for referencing information and thought of as a, as a, a schema um, that describes a current domain. And there are many types of, of structures that are ontology-like um, such as controlled vocabulary, which is a, a collection of vocabulary and, and terms to reduce ambiguity. Um, people also think of, uh, of uh, taxonomy, which is uh, controlled vocabulary terms that are arranged um, hierarchical. And then a thesaurus, same thing, the vocabulary terms, but it's a, a, uh, arranged as a, uh, as a specialized network. But an ontology can also be thought of as a software artifact. Um, that it's typically created to meet a specific use case. So in literature, the term ontology is, is often used inter interchangeably with these ontology-like structures. So sometimes the, its actual capabilities um, get minimized. But some of the benefits of using ontology is a common vocabulary for shared understanding, and it enables reuse in a domain. And some of you might have heard of uh, semantic web on technologies. Ontologies are the backbone for this type of uh, te technology that enables better use and reuse of information. And they also support reasoning and applications. And the biggest difference between an ontology and these ontology-like structures is that like these other structures, they can be read by humans. But an ontology is also a machine-readable format so we can uh, um, use it to manip manipulate it um, for uh, decision type purposes, often in combination with, uh, with business rules. And so this, uh, by being machine readable, um, it could support researchers and automated reasoners, what's called classifiers, and this is to infer knowledge that's not necessarily explained, um, not necessarily ex explained in the ontology. And it can also capture non-hierarchical um, relationships, which is sometimes important for highly technical projects or um, complicated software. And then lastly, by providing uh, knowledge as models and templates, um, we can assist in the um, automation and extraction of information. Okay, so the first project I'm going to talk about is the Common Data Elements Project. And this is the first of the projects that related to the knowledge representation that um, uses ontological artifacts. And so this project was started out because of the different, the vast uh, variety of how data is stored. Um, and they wanted to overcome the barriers of, of, of data sharing. And, doing, and to do this, they want to identify common data, data elements that all researchers are using and develop common definitions for those terms. So we'll, essentially so all researchers can know that they're talking about the same thing. And so this project is meant to help investigators conduct clinical research. Um, through the development of uniform formats by which, which uh, data elements can be systematically collected and shared across research communities. A common data element is essentially a logical unit of data pertaining to one type of information and is derived from broader definitions that are used across um, the research community. It also has a name and a precise definition and if applicable it has a code. So this is basically a use of uh, 
to standards uh, to provide standardization to to metadata and a, an attempt to foster better collaboration among the research community. And so listed here are some of the uh, current data elements that they've made available and the website that you can uh, access to, if you want to read more about them. There's also a, a significant um, neuroscience initiative going on right now for post-traumatic stress. Um, currently, there is a working group that is um, formed from five federal U.S. agencies that are um, currently trying to develop post-traumatic stress uh, common data elements. And the organization that is in charge of this is called OneMind. And OneMind is a, a nonprofit organization that was started last year. And their mission is to um, support research funding, marketing, and awareness of mental illness and all brain injuries. They want to promote policy improvement and um, increase the, uh, the research to cure rate. And they, to do this, they want to bring, it back, bring together multiple agencies uh, to foster a collaborative environment. And as a part of One Mind, they started something last year called the Gemini Program. And this is a, um, a collaboration for improving post traumatic stress as well as traumatic brain injury. So, to accomplish this task, they're supporting large scale um, clinical data collection programs um, in hopes of developing a large information. Uh, technology structure it's where they can um, better perform comparative um, comparative research and and sharing of data among institutions and this this these efforts have a heavy reliance on data standards and also of uh, synchronizing data elements across all agencies that use the same terms so as a part of their knowledge network they're investigating opportunities for uh, uh, better ways of data curation and they're also uh, looking to develop common data elements for the research community to leverage knowledge of uh, both TBI and post-traumatic stress. And so this program is currently exploring possibilities of, of, um, of storage for the data, and ontologies is uh, one of the potential ways of, that this uh, program might store their data. So the next project is uh, Semantic Medline, and this is a project that is currently underway at the National Library of Medicine. Um, this is one that I'm uh, currently actively working on. And what Semantic Medline is, it's an advanced um, 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 information management application, and it utilizes uh, information stored in documents um, for um, explicit, um, um, explicit domain coverage. And it's provided as, uh, currently it's in prototype version, um, and it's accessible on the web, and I believe I give a website address in a, in a few slides. But it's a web-based application that uh, displays PubMed results in a visual manner. Um, it, it also um, um, provides a summary of some of the terms that you're searching for. And these, what they call predications, which is basically two arguments linked by a relationship, um, it's all presented interactively. You can move this around and um, um, add and remove uh, different relationships in order to focus your search. So the target audience for this is the research community, and they're essentially trying to offer an, another way to search PubMed and by providing a, a visual tool to do it. Some of the uses for this, um, they they promote it as a way to do um, what's called lit literature-based discovery, which you basically look for um, um, unknown phenomenons, um, um, previously unknown um, in the research literature. It it's so, supports something called, I guess, the A to C relationships, where you look for relationships that are not connected to each other. So essentially, I guess, non-hierarchical relationships. And so my goal for this project was to expand semantic resources um, um, expand semantic resources covered by the UMLS, the Unified Medical Language System, which is the terminology structure um, um, that the National Library of Medicine supports, um, consists of about 100 different, 130 different uh, um, controlled vocabularies. 
And so in order to have a more accurate representation of PTS, uh, PTSD for the UMLS, um, what, I was, what I'm working on is adding to their SIMREP ontology. And so SIMREP is, a, is an NLP tool that extracts um, these predications uh, from PubMed. And its ability to do this crucially depends on an accurate um, coverage of domain, which currently it's um, using the UMLS. But PTSD concepts are not covered very well in UMLS. And so what SimRep ontology does first, um, Semantic Medline, the visual tool, it will access uh, my ontology, the SimRep ontology, and if a term is, is not there, then it will access the UMLS. So it uses the, my definition first, which is actually a better coverage of PTS, and, and if it's not there, only then will it access UMLS. And so once the appropriate definition is found, it creates the predication based upon the, uh, the definition of that term. And so here, what I want to give is just kind of an example of how it does, how it creates a predication. So a, a common sentence you might see in literature is, sertraline was used in the treatment of PTSD patients. And so SimRep will extract the arguments, which are in blue, sertraline and PTSD. And it also extract the predicate, which is in pink, uh, treatment. <coughs> And this predicate establishes the relationship uh, between the, the two arguments in this manner. Sertraline treats post-traumatic stress disorder. And then, as a part of the UMLS, um, SimRep uses the semantic network for the relation. And the concepts come from the metathesaurus. And then finally, each concept within the UMLS has one or more semantic types. And so what I'm trying to show here in this diagram is an overview of current coverage of PTSD in the UMLS. So this isn't everything, obviously, just a, a fractional example of it. But we defined our semantic space with these concepts and these predicates. And so the white boxes here represents concepts um, along with their semantic types. And the blue boxes are the predicates. And so the semantic space is essentially a web of connections um, between these, these concepts connected by relations with arrows pointing the way that the, the predication is read. So for instance, at the bottom left, PTSD affects abuse. So kind of some of the steps that I'm, I'm, I'm undertaking is um, identifying the PTS uh, the concepts that are not in the UMLS. And I do this by acquiring a corpus of uh, uh, PubMed citations and also um, from the uh, uh, Post Traumatic Stress National Center. They uh, operate a, a database called PILOTS, uh, stands for, what is it, Published International Literature on Traumatic Stress. And they index everything on, um, on post traumatic stress as well as uh, trauma, trauma injury. Um, anything from books to posters to literature to uh, brochures even. And I also acquire um, uh, uh, rich citations from the domain, domain experts that validate my findings. Once I place these uh, concepts and relations into the ontology, uh, domain experts have to vet it. And so then I run it through sim, uh, SimRep and then identify what's missing. Um, some of the new terms that I found recently were uh, cognitive problems were not in the UMLS. And then I also had to add synonyms for it, such as cognitive issues or um, cognitive failure, I believe. And also some of the, uh, some of the semantic types um, have to be changed. So for instance, um, in the UMLS, uh, the term imagery is uh, a, a type of uh, mental process. But actually, for uh, uh, post-traumatic stress, it's a type of therapy. So that's just, just one of the examples of, of, of the type of things that I'm making changes to. And so this is a continual iterative process where constantly revising the semantic space based upon 
uh, new information as it comes available. And so what I'm showing here is just a, a, that I've enhanced the semantic space. Um, essentially, uh, the, the uh, red boxes are um, new re uh, relations that I've added, as well as the pink boxes are some of the new concepts that, that I've added. And so what I'm trying to show here is that these uh, iterations of, of adding the concepts uh, creates, creates a much more uh, richer understanding of the post-traumatic stress disorder domain. And so unfortunately, we don't have time for a live demo, but again, here is the, the website address if you want to play with it. Um, this is an interactive graph. You can move them around. Um, what you're kind of looking for is all these unique clusters of new information that you may have not have seen before. Um, these arrows that you point on, you can right click on them and it's the, um, these are the relations and it'll give you um, uh, at the bottom uh, the citation where it found that predication from so you can explore more information. And so the last project that I'm going to talk about is a project with the VA. Um, it's called the CHEER project. And CHEER stands for Consortium for Healthcare Informatics Research. And this is a multidisciplinary group that is um, um, a group of investigators collaborating around the VAs from the, around the country um, that want to use unstructured text um, in the clinical narrative. So currently the VA has not been able to um, extract um, terms describing treatments and symptoms in their EHR. And so one of the their projects was to understand um, how clinicians uh, document clinical inf information about uh, post-traumatic stress to patients. And so they were tasked with creating a reference tool that's capable of, of classifying these concepts. And so a schema was developed um, from existing PTS um, knowledge sources, and they also did uh, clinical interviews um, as well as uh, um, uh, literature reviews and, and information from expert panels. But before the information extraction can take place, um, uh, several rounds of annotating has to be done. And annotating is simply just highlighting words in the text and applying attributes and um, um, relationships to them. And so the notes that we're currently annotating are all notes from uh, PTSD patients, so it's all rich in, uh, in terms that is used in that domain. And so what I'm kind of showing here is this uh, arbitrary clinical text that um, we use the schema. And this is a, an example of an annotation tool at the bottom right. And so as we read through a patient's note, we're just highlighting important terms um, that we want to be able to extract automatically. And so after, after we... Uh, finished with this annotation process, um, what the VA is hoping to be able to do with it is uh, to produce a knowledge base that they're able to perform machine learning techniques and different nat natural language processing tasks um, in order to start looking at the relationships between symptoms and treatment. And another option is to arrange the, these concepts into a usable format, um, such as a creation of an ontology. And what is unique about this project is uh, typically ontologies are created from um, existing literature and then domain experts add the terms. Um, but what is unique about this one is that all terms are coming from clinical text. And so um, they're also reviewed by the domain experts, but by all the terms coming from clinical text, you're getting a really rich um, um, coverage of the domain of PTSD. And so I want to also talk about some of these gaps that these uh, researchers are missing. Um, so you would think some 50 years ago when we, start, we first started calling this shell shock that we wouldn't have problems with diagnosing and, 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 and thinking about symptoms. But this, art, this is an article from about, uh, about three weeks ago. Um, this is just up the road here at Madigan Army Medical Center in Tacoma. There is a controversy about... Um, uh, forensic side uh, psychiatrists are going back and changing people's diagnosis 
without discussion with the patients. And so um, you know, there's a lot of controversy and the, the medical uh, director was put on administrative leave. And it's not just here, it's all over the country and it's not just the VAs, it's in community hospitals as well. It's, it's still um, obviously a, a complicated disorder. And with the difficulty in this diagnosis, it's, it's no wonder that our, our treatments have not been um, um, as promising as they really should be. So some of the gaps I want to talk about is, I've already been discussing the gaps in UMLS coverage, uh, both for literature and um, uh, for clinical notes. So again, it's, the UMLS does not cover these terms very well. Um, it's not sufficient for published literature. And it's even worse for, um, for clinical notes. So, and also, I'm sorry, because of this high screening that, that we, or the high prevalence of PTS that we've been talking about, there's a gap in screening. Um, this current screening tools are manual and often considered long and time consuming. Um, many patients will deny symptoms because of this, the stigma. And there's also a frequent refusal of these tools because of um, considered to have long, um, long questions. And so a lot of studies cite a lack of acceptability of these manual uh, screening tools. There's also workflow issues where uh, many providers do not have time to complete, to complete them in their, um, while they're seeing patients. Um, and also an issue of non-specialists that perform the screening. Um, non-specialists, -screen, non um, especially during a patient's initial evaluation, um, recurrence of the traumatic event can have uh, um, can cause damaging and if a, uh, uh, damaging effects and if the specialist is not trained to work them through their experience um, uh, symptoms can often become worsening and there's also a need for secondary analysis of finding symptoms in the clear in the uh, clinical narrative and so kind of thinking as an upstream event intervention um, there's a gap in risk prediction and the various studies that have looked at risk prediction in PTS has not had very good results. Um, in fact, a, a big study was uh, completed in 2009 for, uh, by the National Institute of Mental Health and the VA, and they found a lot of potential, but there was no groundbreaking, um, no groundbreaking findings. And so it's currently not possible to differentiate trauma survivors um, who naturally recover to people who develop uh, long-term symptoms. Um, a problem with the studies, many of them are performed in isolation of other predictors, um, and few have um, um, been able to acquire multiple uh, predictors to, optimi to optimize it. And a lot of this has to do with not being able to get this um, free text that is located in the clinical narrative. And then obviously the studies over our past decades have not found good evidence of what works for PTSD and what doesn't work. Um, there's no universally accepted treatment for PTSD. Um, there's a lot of things that work well, but nothing, nothing um, um, is, appears to, to help. There's no real actual recovery definition of PTSD. And a, a large systematic review that was undertaken by the Institute of Medicine, their working group on PTSD, at the request of the VA, um, they, were, they did a large systematic review that looked at about 3,000 3, abstracts, and um, they found a lot of methodolog methodologic uh, limitations and, and inaccuracies. Um, they found for both for psychotherapy and pharmacotherapy, there's not sufficient evidence um, um, to determine efficacy of treatment. So their major finding was they recommended a, a um, a full-scale research on every treatment modality for PTSD. And there's also a gap in policy management. Um, we mentioned the difficulty of keeping up with new information, and this includes new guidelines that are constantly changing. Um, DSM-5 is actually should be coming out this summer. Um, there's um, a lot of uh, a lot of the new guidelines also often come with like a multi um, a large number of different cri changing criteria for diagnosing it. And so these, these policy changes aren't just for the VA again, it's, it's community-wide. So some of the ways that are possible to address this, um, like I said, there's opportunity to enhance um, 
uh, the UMLS, you know, but uh, um, this is through the application development and such as I'm showing with Semantic Medline. And it's also a good time to start thinking outside of PubMed, um, of, of ways to develop applications to access other information and other, other databases as well. And there's a lot of left work, work left to do for clinical concepts, obviously. Um, there's a, additional concepts such as stressor events, symptoms, and func functional and, um, assessments need to be researched. And so again, with screening, um, because of the subjective nature of, of symptoms and diagnosis, um, this is a good opportunity to automate our screening, to overcome non-specialists um, that are trying to perform the screening. Um, also, this might be more acceptable, um, uh, the automated screening to patients, um, especially um, overcoming um, um, uncertainty of terms or, or, or difficulty answering questions. And for veterans that seek outside care of the VA, um, these tools are also helpful in the communities of, with people that aren't necessarily used to dealing with uh, post-traumatic stress issues. And so since we're already acquiring patient characteristics anyway um, and extracting PTS co PTSD concepts, um, this, the screening kind of leads into risk uh, prediction. Um, if we uh, support these uh, um, use, we support these risk prediction studies with a, a solid knowledge base. Hopefully we can have some better results. And the benefit of being able to predict it accurately is uh, to be able to, able to focus treatment on our high-risk uh, population and apply uh, interventions that are appropriate for these specific populations. And this kind of flows into um, um, treatment. Um, an application ontology should be able to, to um, 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 extract the, the therapy information and the narrative task and help us with decision tools um, for recommending um, um, treatment, which often is related to uh, patients' preferences, preferences and as well as um, the symptoms that they're experiencing. And so making this, uh, large, this, this data to, available to, to providers is, is an increasing challenge. Um, a lot of new therapies are coming available, and it's hard to, for these providers to keep up with the new information. And by being, so easily, uh, so by being supported in a, a, a robust knowledge representation, um, where it can start helping us um, um, provide more personalized treatment to patients. And as I said about the DSM changes, um, ontology structures are also um, robust and um, sound to, to keep up with these types of changes. Um, there's a lot of diverse um, specialized da databases out there, and so there's an opportunity for um, applications um, to use a knowledge base that, that, um, that allows data sharing between these different types of data, databases. And there's also um, these automation techniques can help overcome workforce, workforce capacity. Um, some of the regional disparities of having uh, providers um, not really available in rural area, areas. And this automation uh, leads to a lot of secondary uses such as uh, uh, biosurveillance and research on the population health. So what I was trying to show here, um, I probably don't really have time to go through this, but um, I'm just kind of trying to show a, a, a simple inferencing problem. Um, often when we think of ontologies, we just think of it's a reference terminology, um, but it actually does much more. Um, this was just a simple um, diagnosis um, example. Um, this ontology is um, um, inferencing um, relationships about um, sp uh, different patients, uh, made up data that I've entered, and it's um, diagnosing this patient with a chronic PTSD. And so there's other types of, uh, of uses that, that ontology does. Um, there's other, other ways to arrange it. There's a, a rule-based. Um, there's also um, probability-based, um, which might be more useful for recommending treatments where there's a lot of uncertainty of information. And so these are some of the potential research questions that um, are 
I possibly could explore what model of knowledge representation is appropriate to support medical software applications. Is, is these uh, um, designed ontologies, is, is that what we need or can we get by with um, uh, static structures and just rely on programming and machine learning? And by appropriate, we also need to consider the cost of maintaining and keeping these um, ontologies updated. Another question as knowledge source for as a knowledge source for applications, is it more efficient to expand UMLS coverage or build a knowledge base from scratch? Um, there's been several studies that have that have used UMLS and um, obviously it does not cover clinical domain very well, especially with mental health. Um, but it's uh, several studies have ha have had good results as using it as, as a base to acquire terms and then add to it. Um, but that's a good question. Um, and a lot of the problems that we've had is these data operating in silos because people have been developing um, their own uh, database and definitions independently. Um, so it, can we, the question is, is, is can we use uh, uh, um, common definitions that would promote interoperability between uh, different research projects? And then for screening, is there a difference between accuracy of automated screening or the manual screening? Um, there's a lot of considerations about automated screening as, um, and how it affects workflow um, and accuracy. There's, um, again, these symptoms that show up um, um, a long time after the trauma, so uh, people aren't always constantly looking for them. So an automated techniques um, might have good results with mining data. And then lastly, can we identify risk predictors for the prediction of post-traumatic stress with the support of a more robust knowledge representation structure? So once we overcome the, the difficulty of extracting terms, it kind of starts to lead us down a, a road of developing decision support. Um, the question to think about is, is can we share information between these growing number of databases without it? Um, or can we implement something that will foster better um, collaboration and able to identify these risks faster, risk factors over a, a number of, uh, of databases throughout the community? And so what I'm trying to show here is um, a summary, summary of some of the objectives and capabilities of the different um, projects that I will be working on. Um, I also included an uh, application ontology here at the end, which I think um, has potential to combine some of the benefits of each of these projects. So again, my focus is on knowledge representation and um, building a knowledge base that supports biomedical applications. Uh, biomedical applications and tools. Um, in the long run, these techniques and methods of building these should be um, trans transferable to other types of trauma besides uh, just combat and ultimately other anxiety disorders as well. So as in this chart, you see some of the there's some differences and there's also some over overlaps of um, things they're trying to accomplish. And likely there's probably a lot of synergies available as well. And all of these researchers need much of the same data, um, but they need it with different meaning or different contexts. And so this makes uh, semantics in this domain very important. But um, as I started thinking about this project, you know, as uh, a lot of these standards that are developing is coming to, to the mainstream, um, this is perfect timing for, um, for these organizations and researchers um, to start coming together and, and collaborating and agreeing on terms and um, uh, defining rules of how we're going to use this information. Um, and I think this can ultimately lead to a greater understanding of post-traumatic stress. And so lastly, along with my knowledge man management tasks that I want to pursue in developing um, applications, um, I kind of also uh, see this as an opportunity to put my uh, informatician skills together and be a bridger between each of these uh, research projects and um, bring them together to, 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 for better collaboration.
So I want to thank my advisor, Joan Ash, and also all of DMI students and faculty. Um, thank you to the OHSU's Ontology Development Group, um, the Cognitive Science Branch at the National Library of Medicine, and the National Library of Medicine for my training grant. Thank you. Yes, Bill. Yeah, two, um, two related questions. Um, one is, um, you know, have you looked at SNOMED as a source of terms? And I know that SNOMED is part of the MLS Metathesaurus. And then the second question is, um, um, in terms of the um, sort of uh, augmentation of the MLS Metathesaurus, that historically the MLS Metathesaurus has, has really been a terminology of terminologies, kind of like a meta terminology without um, its own sort of structure and extensions, but is this um, SEMREP project, which I'm only minimally familiar with, actually trying to extend the UMLS Metathesaurus? Or, um, what, well, I, I guess that's the question. What, what is it actually trying to okay, do with I'll, the Metathesaurus? I'll answer that one first. So it's, it's trying to not really extend it, but enhance it. It's a separate um, um, uh, source of knowledge. Um, the SIMREP ontology, a lot of the, so we can't really, you know, um, a lot of the terms that they've, I guess, have, at National Library of Medicine, they've deemed um, strictly for, for pharmaceutical. And so there's certain relationships that they, that they um, in order to make it work correctly for, I guess, the applications that they've built, um, they don't want them changed. So an alternative is, is to develop um, an external um, source of knowledge. Um, so it's it's enhancing. It's not really expanding it. I guess it's how you think about it. Um, so the again, the application that I'm using, semantic Medline, it accesses this this um, hierarchical representation first. And if it's not there, then it goes to look at UMLS. So we're not changing anything in UMLS. It's remaining the same. Um, and so your first question was about. Um, so yes. Yeah, so when I talk about UMLS, I'm kind of talking about SNOMED because that's the main. Uh, clinical terms that they're looking at. And so um, um, a project that I can think of um, for post-traumatic stress, they looked at um, um, acquiring, uh, um, they, a group of experts got together and decided uh, um, some main categories of terms that they need. Um, they came up with a, a list of about 153, and I think SNOMED was about at 80%. Um, then they also looked at ways that words in UMLS could be combined together and used together, and that increased it up to about 90%. So there's good coverage for the basic categories, but when we start wanting to do um, um, sophisticated um, things with our applications, we need something above and beyond these general categories. They need to be a little more specialized. Aaron? How do you know when your ontology is good enough in this particular area? That's a great question, and that's one of the, the great questions of ontology is how to evaluate it, and there's no real good answer, but the, the textbook answer is never good enough. It's constantly being added to because there's constantly new information coming, and there's not constantly um, new researches that changes old ideas, um, so the general rule is uh, um, it's, it's vetted by experts, and kind of when they deem it good enough, it's good enough, even though it never really is. Oh, the, um, so my comment might be that it, while it's, it's true that, that ontologies always continue to evolve and never seem to be good enough in sort of a general sense, I think that there is, in fact, a... Um, adequate way of evaluating ontologies, and of course this is a whole area of research, but um, specifically for the kinds of things that you're talking about, um, the, you know, the standard procedure is to come up with a set of competency questions that you would use to say, well, does the ontology actually function to answer these questions? And in the case of an application, does the application run and do the kinds of things that the competency questions suggest that it should do? And I think in, in developing or, or extending existing ontologies, uh, one or more, that's, that's something that, that's really important to keep in mind. You can't model the world. You have to model the things that you're trying to answer questions for. Yeah, so you can evaluate them as uh, use cases with the application that you're developing. Does your application work correctly or not? 
Any other questions? Okay. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I agree. And I, I was kind of looking for something, you know, more uh, along the lines of, you know, within a given application, we can assess the, you know, uh, amount of, uh, you know, the coverage and accuracy of the concepts that are relevant to that, you know, application. It, you know, what kinds of, what, how common or what concepts come up that can't be incorporated or that there's some ambiguity or confusion over and, uh, you know, and I, and I think that that's a, a reasonable thing to do within a particular, you know, application of an ontology in its current state. Thank you.